everybody. It's Matt from Eastwood Company. Thanks for joining us for another uh, live technical uh, show that we're putting on for you guys. Today we're discussing TIG welding. Uh, we're going to do an intro to TIG welding for anybody that's just new with this or you just want to hone your skills a little bit, learn some things you might be doing wrong. I'm going to try to show you all that in a, an hour period. So we got a lot to cover. Um, hopefully I can get everything in and then stick around at the end. Uh, we're going to do some questions and answers and hopefully I can help uh, some of these individual questions you guys might have. So let's jump right into it. TIG welding, what is it? Um, for anybody that's not familiar with it, TIG welding is basically, it's uh, the best way to describe it, it's similar to oxyacetylene welding in the manner in which you are using a filler rod and you have a torch. So you imagine old school oxyacetylene welding, this would be your torch, your flame, and your filler rod, which looks a lot similar to what you would have used. And that's about where the similarities, uh, they end. Um, with TIG welding, basically, like I said, this is the business end of it. With this, I'm gonna break this down and show you what each of the parts are, what they do, and um, you know, kind of the choices that you have here. So with, uh, with TIG welding, there's a couple major parts as I take this apart here. Um, the most important thing I'm gonna show you is this is your electrode. This is what's actually sending the amperage is going right through this, and this is what creates your arc. This is very important. There's a lot of different um, electrodes that you can choose. I have a few laid out here that I just want to show you guys real quick. Um, probably the most common uh, ones that have been around for a long time. They all have, uh, I should go back and say, they all have little bands on the end here, colored bands. Um, most people just call them red, you know, red tungsten, green tungsten. They do have different elements that they're made up of. Uh, we could probably talk for hours about the different elements, but I'm going to try and keep that short because it was kind of boring. Uh, but basically the red is going to be uh, your most common that's used for steel. Um, with some of these inverter TIG welders that are out there, you can use this for aluminum, but what actually happens when you get into the higher amperage and heat with, uh, with welding AC for aluminum, uh, it'll start to get little like cauliflower like on the end of it that'll make the arc wander and jump around. It's, it's really not great. You can use it in a pinch. Uh, the green here that I'm talking about, the green is really, um, that's an aluminum only um, tungsten. And this is most commonly, was most commonly used on transformer welders for AC um, only. Um, but with the introduction of inverter welders like the Eastwood um, TIG 200 AC DC that we're talking about, and then we also have the TIG 200 DC that we're talking about, those are both inverter welders. So these welders can use um, a little more broad scope of electrodes than some of the other ones. So I have a couple here. Um, we often get questions about why, why are we selling the purple or why, would, why wouldn't you offer the red anymore or you know, the green. The purple one here, which is uh, commonly called, it's like E3 is the, the name a lot of people call it. This one here with the purple band on it. This is pretty good for uh, aluminum, steel, most, most metals. And this will be a lot more stable It'll hold a, a more stable arc. It'll be more pinpoint when you grind it. Um, and you, again, you can use it on aluminum. You can use it on steel. You don't need to switch out your electrode uh, when you're welding like you did with the transformer welder with a red and a green. Um, the other one that I have here that's, um, that's pretty good is there's the gray, uh, ones that have a gray band. So these ones are similar to the purple where they're gonna have a really stable arc. You can use them on basically any type of metal so you don't need to switch them out. So when you're, when you're you know, shopping for electrodes, uh, it's, you know, you're definitely gonna be safe if you're gonna use a purple or a gray or anyone that's in that family. Um, we offer the purples that you can buy right through the website. You can purchase a couple of those and you're set to go. Um, so that's the first major part of the torch that we're taking apart here. Um, the next part, is the collet body and the actual collet. So this is your collet body, this is your collet. Uh, what these do is the collet body you can see on a traditional style has these little holes in it. That's where your shielding gas comes out. So this is where your gas is gonna come out and this is fit into, I'll uh, thread it into one of these. So that basically threads into this, which is your gas cup. And those little holes are gonna shoot the gas out like that and it kind of fogs your, your electrode and uh, see if I can stick that there. So that'll, that'll fog your electrode and also your weld. So the shielding gas is going to go out and around that. 
Um, now what the actual collet does is this collet, um, it's going to be hard to see, but they have little slots cut in them. I'll try to adjust here so you can see them. So you can see the, uh, the slots that are cut in that. The reason that is is when you slide a, um, let me just make sure I have the right one here, 332nd. So when you slide this in here, it actually goes into the back of your collet body and slides through. And what happens is when you take your back cap here, this goes over the end, and as you tighten it down, it pushes on the back of that collet, and which pushes into the collet body, and that's going to actually make those little slots compress, and that's what grabs your electrode, keeps it from moving around, makes a nice uh, tight connection. And you can also see on, the, on this back cap here, there's all different sizes. There's little stubby ones, there's longer ones, um, everything you can imagine. But they all have basically the same thing in common. They have a little O-ring or seal on them, and that just keeps your gas from flowing out the back side of the torch. So this is very important. The size of the cap doesn't really matter. It's just whatever you feel comfortable with using. Um, obviously, the longer ones, you're, you're not going to have to change out your electrode as often if you, you, know, you keep grinding and it gets really short. So an alternative that I just wanted to mention, um, because I use these on a lot, all the torches here, I use them just because I prefer them. Again, it's a preference thing. Another one is a, what they call a gas lens kit. So this is your collet body. And this one here I actually have is a dirty old one, so there's all kinds of specs on it. But what this has is a little mesh screen in the center there. Instead of holes being drilled, it actually has a mesh screen. And the, and the benefit to using that is it actually has a much better fogging ability which allows you to stick your, um, your electrode or your tungsten out further. So you can, um, so this is like that. This is your cup for your gas lens that goes on top of that. See how it's a lot bigger? Um, these call, come in all different sizes, everything from big wine glass style all the way down to like a pinpoint. But the nice thing is you can actually stick your tungsten out much, much further. You know, if you try to do something like that with a, a normal gas cup, it's not going to work. You're not going to get the coverage. But with this, you can crank the, the, um, the gas up, you can get better coverage, and you can get into tighter corners using this. Um, and it, again, it cools, the, the cools and, um, it, and keeps the, uh, the gas around the actual weld puddle much, much better. So I just wanted to mention that. That's a good one. Um, I have them all my torches here. I didn't want anybody to get confused on why we have those, but that's something that we have there. So. Now that we've covered the basics of the, of the torch, um, I want to get into your filler rod, the other part of this here. So I'm going to put this back together just so. But you can see as I'm doing this, this is your back cap here. And I'm going to show you guys that in, a little further on how to adjust this and get it all set up. But I just wanted to make sure that didn't get kicked around. So filler rod is the next thing. So we told you about your torch, you're starting the arc, you're making metal melt. Next thing is your filler rod. It's all different types of filler rod that you can use out there. Um, really the best, again, without trying to talk for an hour on just filler rod, the best thing to remember is try and match your filler rod the best you can to what you're using. Um, this is just for basic, uh, this is your kind of general use um, for carbon steel. Uh, this is what we, we offer. Um, you can, uh, there's stainless steel. There's 4043 for aluminum. There's, there's all different types that you can get. There's a bunch of different aluminums and also steel. So um, you really want to research what, you ha what you're trying to weld and what you need to use. But for if you're just doing steel, which is what we're just covering today, um, this rod here, and I actually have a, a little tube that it comes in. But it's the ER70S that we have here. So you guys can see that. But that's basically the tube it comes in. And the ER70S, again, is going to be probably your most common that you're going to use on carbon steel. And you, we offer these online in the tubes, or you can buy them you know, at your welding supply store if you need bigger supplies. But these little, these little tubes here, are usually, that'll last most people for quite a while. So the filler rods, they come in a bunch of different sizes. Um, you want to match your filler rod basically to like the electrode that you're using, um, generally is a good rule of thumb. So the most common that we, we sell and it's the most common, common you'll use in automotive general fabrication is there's 332nd and there's 1 16th. Um, here's a good way to tell. So 
The one in this hand here is your 1 16th. That's your 3 32nd. You can see the, hopefully see the difference in diameter. Let's give us a second here to get you zoomed in so you can see what's going on. So now that you can see that, there's the same thing with your filler rod. So the most common is 3 32nd and there's 1 16th. You know, you can see, let's see if we'll get difference in those. So you're going to use the 1 16th on, you know, some of your smaller fabrication, um, lighter duty stuff. And the 3 32nd you're going to use on some of your heavier stuff. When you get a little more experience, some guys will, guys or gals will like to use, you know, some people prefer to use the, uh, the 1 16th over the 3 32nd. What happens with that, the reason you, that some people prefer with their welding style to weld fast or slower, and it's just a preference thing a lot of times. So if you're going to use the 1 16th on something like these test pieces I welded up here that's quarter inch, you're going to have to be moving pretty fast. So I, I did a quick kind of comparison here. So this thing I welded with the 1 16th, and then the same joint right next to it with the 3 32nd. It's pretty hard to tell, but the 3 32nd, the dabs are a little bit bigger that you're taking off. So you're filling a bigger area of that. Now, if you're trying to fill this whole um, joint up, your 3 32nd might be a little better because you can actually add more filler rod in there. Um, you can add a bigger dab in, then it's going to fill this a little quicker than with the 1 16th that's a lot smaller. But depending on what you're doing, you may need to stay in a real tight area, so you may want to pick the 1 16th. But again, general rule of thumb is you want to match the, um, the tungsten or electrode to the filler rod that you're using. Um, and then we're also going to get into, uh, towards the end, uh, some real thin stuff with sheet metal. With sheet metal, you're going to probably going to go down to like 030, 035, even 023, depending on what you're doing, 16, 18, 20 gauge, 22 gauge. That's where you're going to have to get a little, um, you're going to have to get a little outside, work outside the box and get something smaller. So what I like to use um, is I, I use uh, MIG wire. So I just run some wire right off the spool and run. This is 030 uh, MIG wire. So we'll show you that towards the end. I have a piece of sheet metal here. I'll show you how to correctly set up a joint um, when you're TIG welding sheet metal and uh, you know, give you a little action shot of that. So now we covered that. The next thing of the whole TIG welding process is the foot pedal. So depending on the machine you're using, your foot pedal is going to look different between different brands. Ours is a pretty basic setup. One nice thing about the Eastwood uh, TIG welder pedals is that we actually have an amperage adjustment right here on the side of the pedal. So if you're working, most times, you know, with the TIG welder, it's going to probably be off to the side there, and it's kind of a pain to keep walking over to adjust your amperage to get it set exactly where you want. So we added a, an amperage adjustment right on, the, uh, right on the pedal. Now, we also offer on our torches, um, hey, that's the mini, sorry, one, one sec. So, that one doesn't matter. Here we go. All right, so you can see this little finger switch here. That's another way that uh, different brands do it different ways. Some have little rollers, um, some have, have little rocker switches like this. So this little, um, this is basically on ours is an on off switch. So you're gonna change your amperage on the machi machine directly and this is just an on off switch. So if you set it to 90 amps, you're gonna get 90 amps. What this is good for is if you're doing out of position welding where you need to tack weld something or if you just can't get into a spot where you can use the pedal, you can set this up to kind of the middle, middle ground and you can get something welded together with this or just tack welded so you can get in a better position to weld it. Um, so these little finger switches are nice. Um, again, personal preference type thing, but there is times you'll find it with roll cage. Roll cages and under dash kind of stuff, you may need to do that. So foot pedal, pretty simple. Um, now that we have that, I'm going to go over the, the controls here. We'll show you on the uh, the TIG 200 ACDC, um, a bit, our machine has, this is probably the most stripped down you can get of just your essential switches and knobs. So we'll work our way around and kind of describe what each of these does. So the, um, this knob right here with the A on it, that's for amperage. So that's the amperage that you're going to weld at. Um, we showed you on the pedal. 
uh, where you adjust it if you're using the pedal. This is where you adjust it if you're using the finger switch. So the way the amperage works, the best way to think of it is the higher the number, the hotter it's going to get. So as you're welding, the thicker the material, the more amperage you're going to need, the hotter you need it to get. So you're going you're to turn this around to where you need it to get. Now on the foot pedal, you're going to adjust that actually to somewhere where it's a comfortable zone for you to put your foot um, to actually move the pedal up and down. So you may set it to 110 um, and you have to play with the pedal a little bit just to get a feel for it to get um, it to be in the sweet spot for you. Everybody's a little different with that. Some people like it to be more wide open throttle um, when they're welding. Some people like to barely be on it but have the ability to kind of go further if they want. Uh, clearance effect, we're not going to go over too much today. This is mainly really just used for aluminum for the AC side. So there's a negative and a positive. What this does is this is going to change um, the actual like the wavelength for the welding so you can get more cleaning or more penetration. With steel, you're really just going to leave it at zero. Um, the last two here are pre and post flow. What these are is this is for your gas. So your pre flow, this is basically how much gas is going to flow, how long the gas is going to flow out before it initiates an arc. Um, so I keep it anywhere from one second to two seconds, somewhere in there, and it gives a split second, you know, before the, um, I'm sorry, point one seconds, I misspoke, um, before it actually starts an arc. A good thing with this, uh, with this is if you have any contaminants that are actually in your, in your hose, this is going to purge that out before it actually starts a, a weld so you don't get an initial uh, dirty weld. Um, the post flow. That's probably can figure that out, but this is uh, this is how long it's actually letting gas come out after the arc has stopped. So an important thing when you're TIG welding is that you do not, unlike MIG welding, where you would just hit the trigger, you make you make your weld, and just take your hand away. With TIG welding, which we're going to show you in a little bit, you want to keep your hand over the weld and let the gas flow over top of that weld until it fully solidifies. So you can change the time that the post flow. It's just dependent on what you're welding, how hot it is, and the type of material. Uh, with aluminum, you may want to leave a longer post flow so that it can cool. Uh, it can both cool and uh, you know solidify. So when we're welding steel, I keep it anywhere two, three seconds, something like that. If you're welding something that's a little thicker, you may leave it on a little longer, but anywhere in that range is is pretty good. Um, so that's where I have it set. So the only other two here, which are pretty self-explanatory of the foot pedal, panel control, so that's the finger switch and the foot pedal like I showed you earlier, and DC and AC. So pretty simple. A lot of other machines out there may have, you know, machines that are a lot, lot more money. They're going to have all kinds of blinky gauges on them that are nice if you know how to use them, um, but sometimes they can be confusing and get you in trouble if you start playing with them and you don't know exactly what they do. So with the bare minimum, um, this kind of gets you, gets you going. You can put some really nice welds down. So the only other thing before we start getting into some other stuff is obviously your shielding gas. Um, so we have a bottle here. Pretty much majority of the time when you're TIG welding, you're going to be using 100% argon. So no, you cannot use your MIG welding bottle. You can't switch it over. If you have a mixed bottle, you need to use 100% argon. Um, and with the gas flow on this, you're going to probably want to turn the gas flow up a little higher. Um, it's a little high on this one right now until we hit the pedal, but um, normally with MIG welding, you're probably going to be a little lower. The inside numbers there is the, um, the CFH, and you're going to probably be down at more at the, um, like the 10 to 12, maybe 15 range. With TIG welding, I like to keep it 15, to 15 or 20 or even a little higher depending on what I'm welding. Um, this is, it definitely helps with the appearance of your weld. And it's going to, um, you know, the cleaner the better with TIG welding, which we're going to show you in a second here. So that's the basics of the, you know, the controls on the machine, how everything breaks down, and, um, you know, how the torch goes back together. Next thing I have to cover, I know sometimes it's a bummer, but I think it's very important for us to talk about, is the safety. Um, TIG welding, it does not, it does not create um, sparks and spatter like MIG welding. Um, but there, so there's not the danger there with that, but there is other dangers. Um, the, the UV light that comes off with TIG welding is really bright, very, very bright. And you can get a, a sunburn or suntan really quick and not the good one. So you want to be welding, wearing a welding jacket or a long sleeve shirt 
something like that. So we offer these welding jackets here that work for MIG welding as well as TIG welding. And this is going to cover your arms, you know, everything that you need when you're welding to keep you from getting burnt. It doesn't take much if you're wearing a short sleeve shirt and doing some higher amperage uh, TIG welding. You're going you're gonna to burn your arms real quick. Uh, next thing, obviously, is gloves. Uh, I got a bunch of gloves laid out here um, so you can kind of see the difference of what you can use. Um, the, the gist of it all, before I go into it, is you need to wear gloves. You might see on TV or you see on the internet guys that are welding without gloves, TIG welding without gloves because there's no, you know, there's no splatter, there's no sparks. Um, but again, you got to think about the heat and the rays that are coming off of that, the UV rays, which is not, not good at all. So even if it's something like this, I keep these around if I'm just doing some thin sheet metal welding um, or if I just need to tack something and I want to throw it on. These are just real cheap throwaway knit gloves but this is going to keep you from getting, you know, block your skin from the, you know, the rays uh, be a small little barrier. Another thing you can use if you don't have anything around, you're in a pinch, just a set of like, uh, you know, mechanic style gloves like this uh, will work fine. These aren't going to help you very much with the heat, but they will block you a little bit um, if you're doing some, you know, low to moderate um, temperatures. Next ones I have here, I have two different style TIG gloves that are actually designed for TIG welding. They use a different type of material. Um, they're a little thinner, depending on the style. Um, these are a little thicker, but they're made to be, um, have a little more dexterity to them than like your, just your normal, oop, traditional MIG welding gloves. So this is, these will work fine, um, but it's gonna be a little difficult to get when you're, when you're trying to learn how to TIG weld. Uh, it can oftentimes be difficult if you're using MIG welding gloves because they just don't bend the same. It's hard to grasp the filler rod. And sometimes this is, this is as much of a problem as uh, you know, other parts of your technique when people are learning how to TIG weld. So it's good to get um, a set of gloves that are, gonna, that are gonna be just your TIG welding gloves. It's good to try and do that, um, something that that's, um, has a little more dexterity to them. Um, do not use, I didn't even bring them out, don't use stick welding gloves. Um, the big, thick, heavy stick welding gloves you're, you're not going to be able to hold the torch. It's going to just completely cover up that torch and it's not going to help you at all. So that's the gloves. Um, obviously the helmet, like with any welding, you do need a helmet to block, block out those harmful uh, rays and the really bright light that comes from TIG welding. Um, you definitely, I would say most, most definitely in my opinion, you need an auto dim helmet. Uh, with TIG welding, you're using both of your hands. You need both your, both your hands to weld you're not going to really have a hand to flip down or it's a pain to, to nod your head down to get it to flip down. Get an auto dim helmet if you plan to do any kind of TIG welding. Um, even MIG welding, it's, it's a big help. Uh, but the fixed shade um, helmets, they're not very good for it. Um, with the auto dim helmets too, you can change the darkness of your lens here. And then also on the inside, um, there's some adjustments for your sensitivity and everything. So when you're TIG welding, depending on the amperage, you can, you can turn it down a little bit to help you, uh, a lens that's not quite as, uh, quite as dark, you can turn it down like if you're doing sheet metal or something like that. You can adjust it to suit your, suit your needs where a fixed lens, it's whatever that lens is. So if you're doing lower amperage, you're not going to be, be able to see anything when you're setting up and may even have trouble seeing the arc on lower amperage uh, welds. So get a good auto dim uh, welding helmet. This is one of our Eastwood uh, logo helmets that we offer that you can see on the site. Um, should be underneath the player that we're that you're viewing this from right now. So now that we talked about the uh, the safety, I wanted to get into um, setting up your torch, setting up your workpiece. What's what's needed, what's necessary, and some best practices. So um, grinding the electrode of the tungsten um, is something that you're probably going to get really good at uh, when you're first learning how to uh, to TIG weld. Let me grab. Let's see here. Pick one that isn't ground already. Um, let's see. And this is a little kit that we offer as well as I'm fumbling around here. We'll just use this, uh, this green guy here. So you can see this thing's got a little ball on the end. So say I want to, uh, this was used for AC welding. But say I want to uh, you know, grind a point on that or imagine it's boogered up. We'll show you how to, uh, to do that. So. There's a bunch of different ways that you can grind electrodes or tungstens. Um, everything from using a flap wheel, 
flat disc on a grinder, which is probably the most crude way. So you can use a stone on a, on a bench grinder. Um, the only thing about some of those methods, the, the, um, the bench grinder isn't so great because, in my opinion, because of the stone, it can kind of be dirty. It can also be a little too aggressive when you're grinding the, uh, the electrode. So what I like to do is I use a belt sander, like this one here. Um, this is the Eastwood belt sander that we offer. And then I added on some 3M. Um, this is 80 grit paper that's on here. What I like to do is I like to pick an area you can see here on this paper. If you're using this for more than just TIG welding, I try and pick an area where I, like this area right here, this is a new section of paper, but I'll try and only grind my electrodes on this area here. The reason, you, the reason I say that is because if you start using your grinding wheel, your bench grinder, or your uh, belt sander, and you're using it for greasy metal, you're using it for just general grinding, what's happening is you're getting, you're embedding that dirt, the grime, the rust, the whatever, into your electrode. Like I've said already, TIG welding needs to be clean. You need to keep that in mind at all times. As clean as possible, as clean as you can be with it. So try and keep it in one area, or if you're using a bench grinder, if you have to use a bench grinder with a stone, only use one side of the stone for grinding electrodes, the other side save for your dirty grinding. Um, I have one ground here that's, depending on the, what you're doing, um, let's see here, this one's ground up. So this one here, that's a kind of a way I like to grind my electrodes. Pretty sharp point on it. So when you do a sharp point like that, what you're going to get is a nice, small, tight arc. Uh, instead of the, the wider this would be, or if you flatten the end of it, you're going to get a little wider of an arc. Then when you have something like this where it has the bald end on it, that's going to give you a big cone shape on it versus a nice, tight arc. So when grinding that, um, there's a bunch of ways you can do it where you can stick your hand here and turn it like this to try to grind. This is a pretty small one, so I wouldn't suggest doing that. A trick that I've, done, I've learned to do over the, um, over the time since I've been welding is just use a little drill. Grab up an electric or cordless drill or whatever and chuck up your, your electrode right into this. So, um, actually, I'll use one that's bad. Let's, do that so you can see. So this one here, this is a bad electrode. So this is one that was dipped in. I did this just to show you guys. Dip that in the puddle and let's see if I can grab this one so you guys can see. So this one here, that's a good one. This is your bad one. Um, you can see it, it was all boogered up. It had basically what happened is as I was welding, stuck the filler rod in. This is something that's going to happen to everybody. Stuck the filler rod in. It touched my electrode. It sucked it right into that and, and fused it right to the end of this. As soon as that happens, you need to stop. Put it in your head. You have to stop. Because if you try to keep welding after you've touched the electrode or contaminated it, you're out of luck. Your weld's only going to get worse. You're going to get more angry. It's not good. Um, so what I like to do, like I said, is uh, you know, chuck this up in here. Put some safety glasses on. I'll throw some gloves on too while we're at it. And then we'll try to get in sort of close and um, let you guys see what it looks like when you're grinding this. So we're going to turn this on here. It's going to get a little noisy. So what you want to do is get that spinning. And start spinning this. The, the, and you got to get all that bad stuff ground off or cut it off first. So I'm just going to grind it off. Check it. Do a little more. I'll do it once again. Hopefully you can see it a little better this time. So a couple things to note. If you noticed when I was grinding the electrode, um, one thing that I didn't mention before I started is the wheel was moving like this. I was grinding my electrode like this with the way it was turning, not against like this. So it's the same thing if you're using a bench grinder, you want to go in front, if this is your wheel, like this. You do not want to turn it sideways. 
By doing it like this, you put little scratch marks in it. What that's going to do is it's going to direct it to where you want it to go. If you put your scratch marks this way and you're trying to weld, your arc's going to wander all over the place. So this is the one that I just showed you. It was all, it was all gunked up. That's what it looks like after it's ground up. You want a nice sharp point just like that. That's what I prefer. Again, depending on the situation, you may want to flatten the end off. Um, but for what I'm doing, I like, to, I like to keep it sharp. So if there's any questions on that, again, you know, that's a, we get a lot of questions about grinding electrodes. You know, at the end, feel free to ask some questions. I can do my best to answer them for you. But that's the basics to grinding your electrodes. Um, grab your cordless drill, grab a belt sander, and try and use just one area of that for how you're going to sharpen it. So get that out of the way. So now that we have the, um, showed you how to grind your electrode as you're setting up, um, we will, I'm going to show you about cleaning the metal. That's another key thing that a lot of times people forget or do not do. So this is a piece that I, you know, we're going to weld on in a, a couple minutes here that I set up. So basically what I did is I hit this with the flap disc. So this is, this is probably the least amount of work you want to do. You want to get a flap disc, and you want to take off any coatings, any grime, any grease, anything like that. One thing to note is that a lot of metal um, comes with a protective coating. So even some sheet metal, it comes aluminized. If you ever bought our patch panel kit, the steel patch panel kit, it comes with aluminized steel. So you actually have to grind off that aluminized coating until you get down to you know, clean metal. So same thing with the thicker stuff. Some of this stuff comes, well, most of it comes with an oil on it. You have to actually clean off. If you leave any type of contaminants in here, even if you do it on the back side, what happens is those contaminants, as you heat it up, start to come up through. So you can clean apart really good up here, and it's greasy down here. You're going to start welding and put some heat into it. That grease is going to come up, and it'll pop up into your weld and spit and spatter, and it's horrible. So make sure at the least you're using a flap disc or a sander, you know, a DA sander, depending on what it is, flap disc to clean it off. Um, another thing you can use, if it's pretty clean metal already, you can use a Scotch-Brite pad. But what I like to do, um, even if I've already cleaned it and it's sat on the table, um, I like to get a stainless steel wire brush like this, like one of these. We also offer a, a smaller ones that you can buy, a little toothbrush style ones, depending on what you're doing. You want to get a set of these and use these as your last thing before you actually get ready to weld. So you want to use a stainless steel brush on your piece, and then even if you want to go as far as using acetone, you can get some acetone, wipe it on your panel to get off any finger marks, any grease, you know, anything from you just handling it. Um, one thing to mention that's really dangerous, do not use, I'm going to repeat, do not use brake clean. Brake clean is the worst thing you could use when you're preparing something for welding, MIG welding, um, TIG welding, anything like that. Because what happens is when you burn that, when you start melting it, the metal, it still has that in the pores. It's going to pop out and that creates a gas that is not good. It's going to kill more brain cells than probably most any drugs. And it's going to make you lightheaded. So it's not good. Don't do it. I've, I've done it a couple of times. You even have to be careful with some of the generic cleaners that are out there. They're not good. They have chemicals in them that when they burn off, it, it creates something, a very hazardous gas. So um, try and use acetone if you're going to wipe stuff down. Keep it to acetone, mineral spirits, something like that. Wipe it down, wait for, wait, wait for it to completely evaporate, keep it as clean as possible. So, all right, so now that we got that set up, now we'll get to the fun stuff, welding. Um, so, get my helmet out here. And one thing to mention when you're starting to get to welding, <laughs> I'll try and hold it up here. Get yourself a seat with some wheels and a seat, well, I'll set it here. A seat that's also got the adjustment on it um, for it to go up and down. The reason you need that is because whenever you're TIG welding, depending on the joint, what you're doing, you're going to need to move around. You're going to need to adjust. Um, if you're on a budget, you can get an office chair or something like that and throw that in your shop, whatever you need. But try and get something that's comfortable and you can adjust. Let me find my handle here. So you can adjust your handle so you go down to where you want it. Um, some people like to be really close like this when they're welding. Um, other people may need, to, you know, depending on your part, you may need to be up taller, depending on what you prefer. So get yourself a seat that's, uh, that's comfortable. We got our gloves, we got our helmet here. Um, the first one we're going to show you 
just so it's easy to, um, for you guys to see exactly what's going on. This is a butt joint that we have set up here on some quarter inch steel. And I'm gonna show you guys how to get an arc started. So we're gonna start somewhere in here. And I'm just gonna run a, a bead without even putting any filler rod in. So I'm just gonna run it across and show you how the, it creates an arc. And then um, as immediately after we do that, then we'll start an arc here and I'll show you running a puddle. Um, but first, before we, you know, before we get into the actual welding, I'll show you with setting up your, how you like your, the hands to get set up and everything like that. So, let's get my helmet on. So, obviously you want your gloves. Cover everything. And, got your TIG welding torch here. Um, holding the TIG torch, let's pull this down. It's something that a lot of people, oh boy, there you go. Well, holding the TIG torch is something a lot of people make the mistake when they first uh, do this. They're holding it like this, or they're holding it up here. It's not really the best way to do it. Um, the way I like this um, kind of describe it is you imagine this right here is like a pencil. So you're gonna hold it kind of like you would hold a pencil. So if you imagine when you're writing, you'd hold something like that, and that's how you're writing. Imagine this to be the same type of thing. So you're gonna grip it like that, put your index finger out like this. Some people try like to hold it up here, which is okay, but the thing that happens with that, and this might be good for you to first learning how to weld because you'll be less shaky. Problem with this is it gets really hot really fast. So you're not gonna be able to weld much at all, and if it's higher amperage, it's gonna get hot way too quick because your hand's right in there. So you can hold it down like this, you can hold it in the middle wherever, but I wouldn't suggest holding it up right on the torch head unless you absolutely have to.